Hello and welcome to another Somerville Media Center business update. Uh, and I'm happy to be joined in this business update with Roisin O'Rourke, who is the manager of Dark Horse Public House in Magoon Square. Uh, how are you doing, Roisin? We're doing well. We're busy, like everyone else, trying to come up with safe and effective plans for reopening. And uh, so we start off asking everybody, you know, that that question, how are you doing? And as, as well as how your employees are doing. Uh, during this uh, business interruption? Well, we are effectively closed for a lot of uh, what we would normally do. So we have switched over to a pre-order grocery program and we're able to bring back some of our staff with uh, our PPP money, which has been helpful on two fronts. Kind of gives them a little bit of security moving forward and trying to make, you know, financial plans for themselves. And it also allows us to run a charitable uh, grocery distribution in partnership with our wholesaler. And that is something that is worthwhile and growing, but it doesn't um, provide us with any kind of like financial benefits. So people are glad they have something to do and it's good to have some money coming in but it's temporary and everything is up in the air for all of us, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you you talked about um, one of the ways that you adapted is beginning to offer groceries um, mm-hmm. as well as this. Uh, can you can you expand on that and also on the um, the charitable uh, donations that you're that you just expand sure. on the details with those? Absolutely. So our grocery program, we are, I like to call us delightfully low tech because we are not necessarily built to uh, work like this. And we update our website on Monday. We have different packages that people can choose from, be it like fruit or vegetables, beef or fish. Um, People can order until Wednesday at 6 p.m. and they can just message us with their phone number and we'll get right back to them. Or they can give us a call during kind of some limited hours on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. And then we make appointments for pickups on Friday evenings and on Saturdays and they're spread 10 minutes apart so that people have time and they don't have to line up or crowd or wait. Um, The charitable grocery program, we started, it it was like kind of fits and starts. Like I uh, ran into a girlfriend of mine who's on the PTA over at the East Somerville school and they had seven families that were, you know, really in need. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can take care of that. And then we, um, I got contacted by a friend of mine who is a mentor volunteer with En Route, which is through the high school. And they had families that were really in need. Mm-hmm. So we made them meals. And then a couple days later, we got them groceries. And then um, we have Winter Hill teachers that come in pretty regularly to the dark course. And I was talking to one of them who would come to pick up some groceries and said, hey, you know, if anybody needs anything, like, let us know. And so then one of the administrators, Nancy McMini over there, got in touch with us and it started to grow. And it was and the need is going to grow. It's going to continue. I don't think anybody in emergency food services believes that this is going to be over just because we reopened the economy. I think a lot of people that are uh, either already entered food insecurity or are on the edge, uh, oftentimes have very kind of higher risk jobs. Um, I am afraid for these families that they may be able to go back to work, may get ill, or their work sites might be shut down. Uh, I think we're trying to get ahead of it, which is why I put together packages um, for families based on like kind of some of the things that are requested, like fresh produce and meat and uh, fresh dairy. And I keep them to about $5 per person per day. And uh, like one box would last for like about two, two and a half days. And it's kind of a supplement for, for people who may be getting assistance elsewhere, but they may not be. I think a lot of times in Somerville, the school system has done an amazing job of letting the community know that 
you know, as a, as a city and as a system that we're here to educate all the children that come through our doors. And part of that is taking care of their families. So families feel a little bit more comfortable going through to their schools. So while people have donated to us, we do have like a, a dedicated fund for that, that a lot of people have given to their PTA as well, which is helpful because there is an extraordinary amount of need. And like I said, nobody thinks it's going anywhere for a while. And we, we were talking briefly uh, beforehand about um, a town hall that uh, some restaurant and and uh, pubs and other sorts of businesses like that took place. Um, they, they participated in, excuse me, uh, with the with the city yesterday, and it was about the the phase two uh, reentry uh, of restaurants and um, interiors are still going to be closed under phase two uh, interior interiors of restaurants, but there was, there is traction on, um, allowing food service into, um, uh, patio spaces, um, and into open air spaces. Uh, am I characterizing that correctly? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I th- I'd say you are that, um, there were several people in the working group that stemmed from that meeting yesterday that are with the city that deal with use of public space. So like the dark horse doesn't have any space, you know, and I, I don't feel like we could um, responsibly put a table on our sidewalk and leave enough space for people to walk by. Um, but we have applied to use parking spots and that would give us A few tables. I mean, you have to think like, it's not just the table, it's the chair, it's the chair pushed out with somebody in it. Um, You know, these are some of the things that we were discussing today. There are licensing issues uh, that they're trying to streamline so that instead of having, you know, six, seven, eight, or nine different licenses and issues that need to be dealt with, typically, uh, like on a one one at a time basis, they're looking to bring it down to one place for businesses to go in and kind of get those needs met. And it's um, it's a good first step. I think that it really jives with the city's idea of creating spaces for people that are not um, quite so car dependent. You know, um, concerns that restaurants had or one that I heard raised, which definitely resonated with me. Restaurants aren't sitting on some vast reserves. You know, it's just not that kind of an industry. So yes, I would like space to put those tables out. Yes, it's going to be, you know, maybe four to eight tables, depending on how many spaces I can get and safely put people in. But then I need outdoor furniture and some kind of, you know, barriers between the road just so that people aren't you know sitting on Broadway with a you know listening to the dulcet tones of the DPW trucks tootling on by um and that's that's money that's that's an investment like how much money do restaurants have to spend on this it's like great I can use my driveway you know but how nice would a driveway be for customers to come in and sit and it's it's interesting because there's definitely very specific issues that are related to infrastructure. There are some restaurants that are are like diminutive and they're in normal times, like very cozy and communal. And, you know, not a whole lot of, a, a whole lot of space for staff or for guests. For me, I have a place that in normal times would have a capacity for 200 people. And even if I got, you know, eight, six top tables out there that's me at 25 percent capacity but none of my bills are at 25 percent so it's yeah I mean it's the same challenges as being closed the bills rack up but your ability to make money is not comparable to what it was ahead of time even the weekend before which normally would be a huge bar weekend you know March Madness St. Patrick's Day, 
I think we brought in less than 15% in sales than we normally would during that weekend. So you're already starting off expecting there to be some kind of, of traditional windfall and then having just nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's now gone on for so many months. It's, you know, it's a, in some ways it's an exciting time to innovate and to streamline and to be creative and to open up opportunities where there may not have been initially. But when I stand back and look at it, it feels like an awful slog. Mm -hmm. and we also we feel like there's a responsibility for small businesses that are part of the city to stay in the city and to fight harder almost to continue to be here. This isn't like we're, we as people like Des is my co-manager and, and Des has grown up here and I've grown up around here. I've lived here for, you know, almost 30 years and like we're invested in what happens in this town. And I, I don't think that you can necessarily say the same thing about a franchise that has deep pockets and can come in and, you know, it just, it's a shame because it's a small to medium sized local business. And those are the drivers of regional economic health. Mm. And, and those kinds of larger, more corporate restaurants can take a hit, uh, a financial hit more than a, a locally owned business. Um, oh, sure. And uh, so what do you, what would you like, what sort of resources would you like to see become available uh, as, as this continues, as this business, business interruption continues, you know, I've, I've been talking with businesses, um, early on and then, you know, throughout this and, uh, you know, I've kind of seen the optimism is, is still there, but you know, it, it, it's waning, uh, as this goes on and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it in you. So, so what, what, what do you think needs to happen? Um, at- there needs to be legislative action and i have been really pleased in a lot of ways with uh, reaching out to city and state and federal representation and and getting interested responses back you know but i think that if we we can't just hope that landlords and banks and mortgage companies, you know, are, you know, like out of the kindness of their hearts do things like I, I, there needs to be a a legislative move that kind of releases the stress from the entire system. You, You know, it's not fair to, for my landlord to not get paid if they're still paying off a mortgage. So where where down the line do these things, where's the rigid spot that's going to make things break? And that's what needs to happen. So as far as what, what I can see, there's um, dedi- not so much my local banks, you know, like they've been amazing and helpful and, and they're working like dogs. And I so appreciate that. Um, but kind of the, uh, dedicated mortgage companies, I've seen and heard from other other people like they're just not budging. Mm. I was I was talking to one of the senators' office, and they said, and this was in the first like ten days of the shutdown. Um, it's mortgage companies and insurance companies that already had their lobbyists out, and I don't understand why it feels really, really short sighted. It's not like. It's not like there's going to be investors in equal numbers to the numbers of businesses that fails to come flooding the market with a a low profit margin uh, industry. But it's still an industry that's really crucial for Massachusetts and and definitely for Somerville as well. So, yeah, that's what I would like to see. Mm. I would like to see legislative support. Something's got to give and it shouldn't just be like you and me and you know all the little people as it were right and and the goodwill of the community which which you know uh which we definitely have have seen 
um, it, as they support small businesses and local businesses, it, it shouldn't just, there's a limited, that's a limited resource um, when it comes to, to bills that, that businesses have to pay. Um, and uh, I mean, if you're not, if you were in like, we're in a pretty saturated market. So when it came to doing takeout, I mean, we're primarily like a bar, you know, we serve wings and nachos and things like that. And they don't necessarily travel well. <laughs> so, you know, and we're also next to places that are dedicated takeout places that already have, you know, uh you know, a consistent stream of people. And that's where their mind goes to. They're like, oh yeah, let's go X, Y, Z. Because we did try that to start, but it just wasn't something we were known for. So it wasn't particularly successful. Right. And even places that did have a somewhat developed, you know, takeout system, it didn't work for them either. It's not the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you'd asked me before the, the, the call, if, um, what other businesses were thinking about the, the reopening, if they were ready to, to reopen their restaurants. And so I'll, I'll put that question to you. Um, you know, are, do you think restaurants are, are ready to reopen right now? Um, I think that we we need a little bit further guidance on some things. I know that a lot of these guidelines are put together and they are pretty thorough, um, but sometimes there's more specifics that, that need to be given. And also I think uh, there's a lot of frustration for me, definitely, and from some others that I've spoken to in that, I know I just said that they... <laughs> <laughs> do things as quick as they can, but the information doesn't come out like quite as fast as you need it. You know, you're talking about opening up for outdoor spaces on the eighth. That's what, four days from now, five days, maybe. And I still don't know if I can have the spaces out in front. Well, okay. And then I just magic up outdoor furniture and and a way to try to make it nice. Remember that stuff I talked about not really having the capital for? It would be good to have a little bit, little bit more time to kind of come up with some solutions because you're forever just kind of juggling the whole maybe, what if. It's not something that you can really invest in. Mm. So I think getting a specific guidelines, having them go out early enough for it to be feasible. You know, I don't have um, you know, a team of contractors so that I just tap on and you know make it rain with my sweet sweet ppp money and like boom right. patio like it doesn't happen right. and then there's also issues about um and i didn't even realize this was a thing because we don't have outdoor space but to apparently there's some kind of licensing need to serve alcohol like to cross the sidewalk with alcohol i'm like oh sweet jesus like you know, it, uh, it yeah. just seems like such a high holy mess. But yeah, it sounds like it's a lot. And that's, yeah, I mean, there's a, some really seasoned uh, restaurateurs that are that are very kindly volunteered to co-chair that working group. So I'm hoping that between them and the city, uh, that they're able to actually have that real streamlined process ready to go in three days. Mm. Mm. Well, well, good I luck believe. with that. Um, <laughs> and, and as we, as we wrap up here, um, how can, how can the community continue to support your business and other businesses, um, you know, keeping it local and, and just, you know, obviously buying uh, buying groceries and ordering takeout is, is one thing. Are there, are there other things that people can be doing uh, to helping to, to be helping small businesses right now? I honestly, I think one of the best things that people can do is kind of wrap their mind around what it means to reopen an economy um, and to take care of yourself and to take care of the people that you're around. Like I, 
I hear horror stories from places that have already opened up about people just like enraged at the thought of having to wear a mask. And it's like this, these are the little prices that we pay in order to kind of go about in society and do the things that we want to do. You know, I, I get it. It's not fun. My kids, I had a mask on my son yesterday and he's just a little mouth breather. It's gross. And he's like, it's wet. I'm like, Oh God, yeah. get an extra mask, you know? Huh. And I think that will probably be the most helpful is if we all just kind of acknowledge that we don't want to be stuck in our houses all summer. And that when we're all asked to do things, like there's a reason for that. I don't want to bring anything home to my family. I don't want my staff to get sick. I don't want them to bring anything home to their families. I mean, we all have elderly people and people that are compromised in our households and like, we don't want to get anybody sick. You know, you don't want to be that super spreader. So being supportive, obviously, like you said, you know, going to, going to different business camps is, is terrific, but also to just everybody give themselves a little bit of a break and understand that we're all trying to get through this in a kind of, safe and congenial way and yeah. until you know hopefully sooner rather than later we can get things more to normal than this new normal which is kind of crap i think we'll agree. <laughs> very well put and uh i appreciate uh you taking the time to chat with me about about you know what you're saying and what your what your what your experience has been um because it, it's an important perspective uh, the, the perspective of small business owners, the, the perspective of restaurants right now. And um, that's why we want to continue to highlight um, both both um, small businesses and restaurants at this moment. Um, Roshino O'Rourke, manager of the Dark Horse Public House. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for inviting me on. And take care. You too. See you soon. See you soon. <laughs>